Today, we're going to attempt to do something that's very ambitious. We're going to try to provide lots of active learning opportunities so that you have lots of things to kind of engage in. But we're also going to try to really push a lot of content at this, like we're going to try and do both. Okay. So that's, that's a very ambitious plan. So we're going to kind of keep the pace up. And then we're going to also ask you to engage in things, click on links, add your input, things like that. Okay. So let's get, let's get started. Uh, once again, my name is Andrew Shaver. I'm the instruction and technology coach at Ingham ISD. Uh, I'm also the director of REMC 13 and a co-conspirator of 517 EdTech. I'm Allison Rogers. I'm the instructional technology specialist at Clinton County RESA and a co-leader of the 517 EdTech network. I'll go ahead. I'm Christy Lobdell. I'm with Eaton RESA and I'm the assistive and instructional technology consultant there and part of 517 EdTech as well with these guys. Hi, my name is Phil Booth, and I'm an assistive technology consultant at Ingham ISD um, with Andrew at, at Ingham. So thanks for having me and enjoying to get to know you guys in the next three sessions. Um, okay, so one of the things that we're going to be attempting to do throughout the next couple of sessions is modeling some sort of reduced barriers or hopefully barrier-free uh, instructional techniques, assessment techniques, uh, ways to help break some of those barriers down. One of the things that you're going to notice, though, is that we're going to struggle because we can't create the kind of environment that we can model that stuff super well. And one of the evidences of that is this, we can't, we're not going to get to know you guys nearly as well as we want to in order to be able to do that. Okay, here's, here's, but in an attempt to kind of turn some of that data around so that you can have a sense of who you're in community with, uh, here's a couple of visuals that'll help with that. Um, <clears throat> so these here on, what is this, slide three, will show you uh, kind of the areas of expertise of the people that you're in community with for the rest of the school year here uh, on the educator's workbench. And then the next slide over will show you where those people are at. And you can see that right now we have got just a very wide variety of educators, educational areas of expertise, the grade levels that you work with, the districts that you work in, the backgrounds that you have. And that's actually a really important point as far as what it is we're going to try to get done here in the next uh, couple of months. So just to give you the, the schedule, session two is March 13th and session three is May 2nd. We're going to meet both of those days just like we're meeting now uh, at four o'clock on Zoom. Um, the reason that those are spread apart so far is, is one, we're, and we're going to talk about this in a second, we've got stuff we're going to send you uh, and it's going to take us a second to get all that stuff in and get it out to you. And then we want you to practice in between sessions two and three. So we got to give you time to actually integrate some of those things in and try to practice some of that stuff. All right, so moving into just some norms, normal Zoom norms, not to be confused with norm from those, Cheers. Those are and two norms. Throw that one in. <laughs> um, so you know, obviously what you guys are doing right now, meet yourself unless you're talking um, and already addressed the recording. Um, and as Andrew mentioned too, this is going to be structured a little bit differently than the next two sessions. The sessions will be more um, content driven by us facilitators for session one uh, with some collaboration engagement activities built in. Uh, we will keep an eye on the chat and address questions as they come up. So you can throw in questions and comments as needed. And then as we also threw in the chat, the slide deck that has links to basically everything for today. Um, including the engagement activities and then the sign-in form that we'll um, address at break. And then moving on to some housekeeping items. So each session will be recorded and emailed post-session in case something unforeseen comes up and you're unable to attend live. But we really want to stress the importance of attending live, especially since our next two sessions will be more participant-driven. Um, 
Six sketches will be available to anyone who attends, who attends all three sessions and fills out all three sign-in forms, so just like a normal PD. Um, and then the, you know, the, the good part of this, of this whole training is the box of resources and the copy of your book. Um, that's going to be shipped or delivered to your school using the address that you provided in the sign-in um, or the initial like, registration. And we're hoping to get that to you before um, next session. And as I mentioned, the attendance sign-in will be discussed during the break and everyone should fill that out regardless if you want sketches. Um, and then lastly, we will review the Educators Workbench Google Group at the end of the session. We'll go through um, kind of the whole purpose of that Google Group and then um, we're gonna stick around if anybody has any questions or challenges getting into that Google Group. So those are the housekeeping items. And then just a little context, I know many of you are regulars in our 517 EdTech group, but for those of you who are maybe not quite as familiar as others, um, 517 EdTech is our, well, it's made up of um, Ingham, Clinton, and Eden counties. So educators within those three counties um, can attend any of our professional development opportunities, our um, gatherings, we have quarterly gatherings where we network and collaborate. And we're, that 517 EdTech group is all under the umbrella of REMC 13. And again, REMC 13 includes those three counties. So you may have heard these terms before, um, but we just wanted to show you exactly, you know, where REMC 13 is on the map. And then also um, linked in there, if you click on the logo, is our 517 EdTech website that details all of the offerings we have, everything from maker kits to our workshop and share series, um, the information for this session's on there. There's lots of resources built into REMC 13 as well. So just wanted to give you a little bit of context before we dive in um, to the content for today. Okay, so we've been kind of talking about uh, our, what we're gonna do today in general terms and introducing ourselves, but here's the agenda. Um, and along with the, address for you to follow along on your own with the slide deck. Um, the bit.ly is very helpful for you if you're able to scroll with your tabs back and forth or or hopefully I mean you have more than one screen. but so we're trying to get through the introduction at, to 415 and then this is all based off of a, um, a book that Christie's going to explain more to us and we're going to start talking about mindset at 4.30. And then um, there's four different areas of the mindset that we um, want to really get into and which the book also covers. So, so learning something every, uh, new every day, function first, authentic inclusion, design over accommodations. And then at 5.50, um, we'll have the next steps and reminders for the next session. And so, and, the most important thing is the break that I that I glazed right over on there. So um, that should be a, a full day for us after your long day at school. So um, in general, um, you know how these sessions go, right? They always start with some opportunity for you to have fun. That's not really an opportunity. They like force you to do it. Well, we were just really transparent about that. Okay, so here's our first fun opener. Okay, you will have fun, I promise. So what we want you to do is go ahead and click on that Jamboard logo or on that link. Either one will do fine. And what that's going to do is it's going to take you out to a Jamboard. If you've never used Jamboard, it's sort of like a, um, a whiteboard tool like Smart Notebook or like Promethean uh, Active Inspire, it's got the same kind of feel to it. It's a pretty simple tool in the sense that there's only a certain number of things you can do, okay? But what we're gonna have you do is that we've got five, these are called jams. These are, we got five jams and they're all the same, okay? So go to any one of them, it doesn't matter which, we just don't wanna get any one of them too crowded. And you're gonna click over here on this button, it's a sticky note. And when you do that, 
it'll pop up this little thing and you can get a chance to type in there and then it'll post like a post-it note onto that and you can drag it around and move it. Okay. So what we want you to write about briefly is food. Okay. We all need it and it's consumable by its nature. So we all have to replenish our stock. So what we want you to do is write about your plan, your routine, how you get food from where it exists to in your house, okay? And I don't want to say too much more about that because I don't want to winnow your thinking, but like most of us have food in our house. So everybody goes through some sort of a process of getting food out from out of their house to in their house, in their cupboards or fridge or whatever it is, however you do it, okay? So I want you to, to share out a little bit about what that process is for you. And then go ahead and put it on a sticky note. And like I said, I'm leaving this purposefully kind of open-ended because I don't want to like winnow your thinking. I just want you to think about how the food that's in your house goes from, like it doesn't grow in your cupboards, right? So somehow or another, it goes from out there someplace to in your house. And what's that routine? Everybody's got some sort of routine, unless you don't. And then you can write that too. So, okay, let's take two minutes and think about that. Maybe two minutes is too long. I don't know. We didn't really talk about that part. Some time. Take some time. All right, good question. Just got asked in the chat. Someone, like when we say refresh, it's a good question. What we're talking about is this little circle button up here, and that'll refresh your whole like URL. That'll refresh the whole web page. And then if a setting has gotten changed since the first time, that will reload it with the new settings set. And then once again, if you're, if the sticky notes aren't working right, remember just over here, you just click on it one time and it'll pop that up. And then up here, you can choose whatever color you want if you are picky about that. And then you just start typing. And then when you hit save, it'll populate that sticky note right here. And then you can click on it and drag it around. I think I can click on that one and drag it around. Okay. Now, make sure you take time to scroll through and see what everybody does. These are all pretty interesting. A lot of people playing. <clears throat> I do notice one of these has a uh, slaughterhouse reference. So <laughs> if you depending on where your food comes from. I know that there are people too whose food <clears throat> made it into their cupboards without a trip to the store because they spend all year, all, all the growing season growing things and then can like crazy and then sort of keep their cupboards stocked with that kind of stuff. So there's, you know, that's one of the reasons I left it open-ended. I did like the reference to, to the husband who gets asked what he wants and he doesn't know. Apparently that's <laughs> part of the routine is to, Give the, give the husband a chance to chime in and not be at all surprised when he doesn't offer anything. <laughs> okay, so as you look through these, one of the things we kind of hope that you'll recognize is that this type of process, okay, it's got a clearly defined goal. It's got a whole different wide variety of different ways that we can accomplish this goal. And people don't often have to collaborate on it in the sense that you, it's not important to any of you what the rest of you do. All that matters to any of you is that the goal is met, that when it's time to cook dinner, there's food in your house, or when it's time to eat dinner, there's food in your house. Maybe you didn't cook it, whatever, right? And so you could use an app and have someone drop it off at your house. You can have an app and then go and get it put in your trunk. You could grow it. You could have someone bring it to you. You could spend all day out because you have an audiobook in your ears and you don't want to go home. I mean, like all kinds of stuff. Okay. But the point is that this type of thing has a very clearly defined goal, a whole lot of different processes that'll get you to that goal and left to all of your own devices, you'll come up with your own way that makes sense to you that doesn't have to make sense to anybody else. No one else has to use your method. 
Okay. And we're using this as the backdrop, the model, the image, the metaphor that we're going to come back to and refer back to as a way in schools for us to think about a certain category of tasks. And it's more than you might think where if the goal is clearly defined, then the process to achieve it could be unique to the individual and that it doesn't necessarily matter to the other individuals per se, what any individual is doing, that that person can kind of craft their own experience and that it would be probably okay. So we're gonna use this metaphor and we're gonna refer back to it kind of as we go, okay? All right. And so here's the book. I know that you guys have seen this image because it was part of our um, registration process, but um, we chose this book for a number of reasons. Um, Inclusive Learning 365 is the title. And the 365, as you can guess, stands for one day of, or of all the days in a year. So the idea is that you would pull from this book a new strategy every day. Um, Allison's gonna talk a little bit more about this, but it's not meant to be a book that you sit down and read cover to cover. Um, however, the part that we're gonna be focusing on today is the intro. We felt like the introduction in this book was really valuable and really set, set the stage for what it is we're trying to accomplish with this training. Um, and, and we're gonna go into that over the next hour and a half here. Um, the four authors are all educators. They all come from a variety of backgrounds. They all have some sort of tech in their background. Um, I think three out of the four have a special education background. Two are speech therapists. One has been an administrator. Um, so they have a, a wealth of knowledge um, in this area of kind of adopting that inclusive mindset, um, which we're going to talk more about. So when we look at this quote, nope. we'll just back a little bit, Andrew, thanks. Uh, innovation and progress are accelerated when heterogeneous individuals work together to solve problems. So looking at this group here, uh, we, we kind of shared those graphs and what the makeup of our group is. And granted, we only looked at two things. We looked at what your job is and where you do your job. And we know that there's so much more that makes up who we are um, and we could dig in and really make a graph encompassing so much more of who we are, but we're gonna pull from all of our differences um, to help um, drive this training and um, solve those problems. All right, Andrew, um, strategies. So this book talks a lot about tools. It talks a lot about websites. It talks a lot about the things you can use in your classroom, but what it really focuses on are the strategies. So it broke down the strategies into these eight categories. You can see those up there on the screen, cross content. So it works um, for a number of, of um, purposes, reading, writing, STEAM, research and studying, executive functioning, social, emotional, professional learning. Um, so if you're needing a content specific strategy, it's there for you, or um, a lot of these can work across, across content. Um, one other thing I wanted to say about this book is that you guys were able to choose whether or not you received this as a hard copy. Um, if you didn't want it as a hard copy, you could choose it as an ebook. And I think we had about 10% of you who um, chose to have that as an ebook. Uh, so we will get to that to you in whatever format you you chose to, um, to have that delivered. Um, inclusive mindset. True inclusion happens when we design educational experiences with everyone in mind. A truly inclusive experience is designed in such a way that any learner, regardless of ability, can participate in it and learn from it. Um, that's a tall order, but we're gonna talk about ways in which uh, we can design our um, educational experiences in a way that can meet the needs of all of the learners in our classroom. Yes, it's ambitious, but um, I think we'll get there. And Allison's gonna talk more about this, but really it's just tiny steps every day. We're not trying to completely um, revolutionize the way you teach, 
um, because everyone's doing an awesome job, but we're gonna just take some tiny steps because as we shift to this new mindset of thinking and thinking about authentic inclusion, um, we'll see different results in our classroom as well. All right, so the next um, section of our time here is going to be broken down into four areas. Andrew, could you pop it to the next screen? Um, and as we read through the introduction of this book, these were kind of the four big ideas that stood out to us. Um, and we felt like these were the, the four areas that were most impactful. Um, and so this is kind of what's gonna drive our next hour or so of learning. All right, so I am starting off with our first strategy and that is learning something new every day. And we can move on to the next slide. And I will say that I have probably the, the most obvious strategy when I was going through this strategy. I, a lot of it was like, yep, like no kidding. Yep, that's a good point. But I think since so much of what we will be learning and discussing over these next three sessions might make you feel like perhaps your previous plan of attack was wrong or not good enough, or that maybe you need to like scrap everything and start from scratch. So like that is not the intention of these sessions. We don't want to make you feel this way, but we the purpose is to kind of broaden your mindset and sort of shift what you do in the future. So we felt like these two quotes expressed that sentiment, right? So don't like beat yourself up for what maybe you were doing in the past. So this do the best you can until you know better Then when you know better, do better, right? So we've been operating on, you know, what we know is best now. And then we're going to use this new knowledge over the next three sessions to improve upon that. And then the other quote we found was when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? And so it's kind of that concept of being a lifelong learner, which all of you joining us today, I think just signing up for this session um, kind of gives you the uh, credit that you probably already have that sort of mindset that you're always looking to learn something new and um, actually take that information and improve. So, or allow yourself to change your mind. So with that, um, I wanna move into my first little quote here. And that is from the introduction of the book. Learn one new nugget of information every day that you can apply to the educational experiences you design. Not exactly um, anything new, but it's a worthy concept of reminding ourselves of every day and to be intentional about that, right? It's so easy to get um, bogged down with all of the other millions of things you're doing every day. Um, so that's why I recommend setting yourself up for success. And what I mean by that is pre-setting like maybe your email inbox or your Twitter feed by like subscribing to or following some leaders or, you know, each other in that world. Um, that's where I get a lot of my resources um, is, you know, getting those subscriptions sent to me weekly. Um, and you can always, you know, set up rules in your inbox if you like don't want to actually clog up your inbox. So when you have time to look at it, but it's great when you actually have the time to look at some of that content. I know that's not all the time. Um, or maybe just set aside five minutes every day listening to, you know, a podcast or, um, you know, something that's really tangible and doable. That's, you know, it, it's important to set goals, but obviously they have to be realistic. So that's kind of the, the nuts and bolts of this first, you know, idea is learn something new every day, take one little nugget of knowledge. So the next slide, just share some of my own providers that I use um, on a weekly basis. I've listed several um, really great ed tech leaders around the country. Um, I really enjoy Shake Up Learning by Casey Bell. If you've been to my call, you've probably been to one of her sessions. Um, actually, the, those first four people listed, Matt Miller, Alice Keeler, Eric Kurtz are all my call folks. Um, Dish That Textbook has awesome resources for um, like Google templates. All of these resources really have great 
um, usable tools and resources that aren't necessarily like blog posts where you have to read, you know, it's like, it's like when you're trying to find a recipe and you have to read their whole life story before you actually get to like what you need in the recipe. A lot of these folks kind of get right to the point and give you resources that you can actually use tomorrow. And I, I personally find those more helpful than having to sift through, you know, some of the, the content at times. Um, I also would recommend following any of these folks on Twitter, but I just wanted to list some of the resources I use. And then at the top linked, I have also a couple other, if you're looking at it from like more of an ed tech perspective, the unlinked ones are probably your game, but the ones listed at the top, um, I came across Wonderopolis a couple of years ago and it, this one's kind of cool for kids. It's literally, um, you can learn, they have every day, like a new piece of knowledge on literally anything in the world. Um, so just kind of adapting that to what makes sense for your students and, you know, allowing that curiosity to thrive. And then the other one I wanted to mention was the National Online Safety. This one is actually, you can subscribe to an email every Wednesday, you'll get, it's called Wake Up Wednesday. You'll get an email that um, basically gives you a little PDF um, infographic that discusses like the most current or the latest um, game or social media tool or some sort of tech resource that kids are into. And it puts it in terms that parents and um, educators can kind of navigate to help um, encourage safe use. So those are my little nuggets um, that I use on a weekly basis. The next slide references two more quotes from the introduction. Educators model learning from learners and invite feedback and demonstrate that learning and demonstrate that learning is an ongoing pro um, process. So we, I think sometimes as educators, don't always, you know, the term like toot your own horn um, or advertise your awesomeness. So I think, and that can be a very uncomfortable thing. I, I can relate to that um, back when I was in the classroom, but I think it's important to at least share what you're doing with each other in whatever space feels comfortable to you. It doesn't have to be on Twitter. It doesn't have to be on social media. It can be in other ways. It can be inviting, you know, a fellow teacher into your classroom for 10 minutes while you're like trying out a new lesson or posting in our new Google group, asking a question or sharing, hey, I just tried this, this flopped, what ideas do you have? Because um, I think asking for that feedback allows, allows you to, I don't know, it's a, it's a rich part of that process of, of improvement. And it can be kind of intimidating at times, but I also want to mention that, you know, asking for feedback both from colleagues and fellow educators is important, but also students. I think we all probably know this, like, hey, how's it going? I think that question, not just like, how are you doing? But like, how am I doing? Like, was this, you know, how'd you feel about this lesson? Just being, you know, transparent in ways like that. Again, none of this is earth shattering, news breaking. You all are probably like, yep, let's move it on to the stuff we don't know yet. But just good to remind ourselves that these are all um, valuable um, concepts to just reiterate on a daily basis. So the last part of my section, since this is the, the more obvious one, is the part where you get to participate. So um, we're just going to use that wakelet that is linked in the slide deck on slide 20. If someone wants to throw that in the chat for easy access to, that would be helpful. And all we're going to do is go to that wakelet, and I'd like everyone to add their um, name and then throw in a resource that's something that they frequently use. Um, it doesn't have to be like, you know, a subscription or anything. It could literally be a tool. It could be an article. It could be um, any, any sort of something that you use in your daily professional life or weekly professional life that you think is worthy. It also doesn't have to be anything like earth shattering or new. Like you might think like, oh, everyone knows this resource. We don't care. Go ahead and throw it in that link. So um, I believe what it will do is if um, you go into that link, you'll type your name in. And then what you can do is click a little, um, you can either paste the web address right in there, or you can click, yep, that little text button. Um, the first one right there, Andrew. You want to type, yeah, that one. And then you can actually, if you click on that, it will allow you to type in text. And you can also like link the text just if you want to get some context. So just take, I don't know, I'm checking our time. 
take like a couple minutes to throw in whatever resources you want. It can be one, it can be 10, doesn't matter. Um, and then obviously also peruse what other people have posted. And this can be a living, breathing, ongoing thing. Um, this doesn't have to be done after this activity. If you wanna, um, we can keep this going in the Google group as well to see um, what people have discovered. So go ahead and take a few minutes to throw in your resources. Yeah, that's actually a really important point that Allison made that I, I wanna highlight. She made a lot of important points, don't get me wrong, not just one. But uh, when she said, just because like, if you think it's just a normal thing, yeah, everybody probably knows already about this. Two things about that. One, everybody doesn't know about ever, anything. Like there's always somebody who doesn't know about it. So share the thing out if it's helpful. Second, just because you're using it and they're using it doesn't mean you're using it the same way. So don't be afraid to share that out for the same reason. Like they may see the way, like the fact that you've referenced a helpful tool that they recognize, they may be more apt to look at the way you're using it because they're already familiar with the tool. So there's a lot we can learn from each other. Don't censor yourself in terms of helpful resources. <clears throat> and if you are new to Wakelet, that's okay. Go ahead and put, if you've got questions in the chat, we can work through some of that stuff. But this is part of what we're modeling as well, is that part of a classroom that is reducing barriers is having a lot of different kinds of tools that you're able to use so that you can sort of pair things up. It's not like, it's not about, I don't know, we'll get into more of that. Actually, I'm about to talk about that. <clears throat> Andrew, can you do a quick refresh on your screen? Yeah. Am I not, it does it not refresh live? No, I think you have to click refresh. Ah, oh, bah, humbug. So we can see all the nuggets. You may have to scroll down to that part I knew. <laughs> oh. <laughs> hey, Andrew, you got to scroll down. <laughs> oh, I like Hoopla. Somebody just added, oh, Daily STEM on Twitter. That's a good one, too. A couple of Kahoot resources. I like it. I'm about to give that a like. Wakelet makes a great like parent newsletter site too, by the way, because just for the record, I've got a video about that that we'll post to the Google group about Wakelet, three minutes. Cattle, yep. Cast. Oh, Alice Keeler, yep. Gimkit, excellent tool. There's a new one that fits in the genre with Kahoot and Gimkit called Blookit, B-L-O-O-K-E-T. And I hear good things. All right. I don't know about you guys, but I am looking forward to digging into this list myself. Many of these resources are newer to me too, so... I think that maybe this Wakelet should be something that we just have linked in our Google group. And um, maybe we even circle back to this every session, just, you know, if there's something new, throw it in. Um, I, I love a good crowdsource and this definitely seems to have delivered. So thanks for everybody's participation. Well, and look at all the genres too. Like we've got some Twitter feeds, we got some tech tools, we got some podcasts, we got some library resources, like, so it's, you know, because I've been in them before, too, where it's just a bunch of Twitter handles, which is fine unless you're not on Twitter. And then none of those resources are useful to you. So cool. I also don't mind Allison throwing just a little bit of shade at the people who write like a 2000 words before they actually get to the actual recipe. Like at least put the recipe on top. I can read the rest of it if I'm interested in kind of the story. But anyway. All right. <clears throat> So the next one is function first. And these are coming once again out of the introduction to the book. Um, because ordinarily the introduction gets kind of skipped over to get to the like meat of the book. But this one, I would definitely not skip the introduction. So let's talk about function first. So the, one of the quotes I want to pull out of the book is the tools may change. 
be incompatible when hardware changes. And much to our frustration, even go away at times. Okay, if you've been in this game long enough, you remember a tool you really liked that you can't use anymore for a whatever reason. It's going to happen. Just know it's going to happen. By focusing on strategies and the function of technology, we are better able to align our use of technology with pedagogy. So we're going to do some things in, in our time that uh, sort of overcorrect for showing you a variety of tools. And that's purposeful so that you can see lots and lots of different things. Okay, I wouldn't necessarily teach a class full of students that way on an ongoing basis where you're just always throwing new tools at them. But the point is that there's two different pieces going on. And I want to illustrate this with a story. So Kahoot came up a couple of times. If you're not familiar with Kahoot, it's like pub trivia, except in the classroom. Okay. More or less. It's got that same engaging feel where you get points for answering things right and faster. It's got fun little jingles and it's got kind of an exciting uh, and exciting, engaging, interesting vibe to it. Okay. But it's kind of a one trick pony. Okay. It really only does like one thing. Okay. And you can kind of use it a couple of different ways, but you know, it's not a really broad tool in terms of its application. So <clears throat> I would not consider Kahoot to be a super powerful tool, but I will say that any tool can be powerful if you use it in a powerful way, okay? And I wanna give an example to that. So I stumbled across this. I used to teach high school math. And what I would do before the review, cause you know, maybe you give a test on a Friday and then Thursday and Wednesday are like review days, okay? And then you want the kids to engage the review so that then they do really well on the test. Well, what I found out by act quite by accident is that if I gave a Kahoot on Tuesday and made it actually really, really hard about all the stuff that was coming up in the test, then the kids would be really engaged in it because Kahoot's a super engaging tool. And they would also learn that they don't know the math very well. So then they would be bought in to do the review for Wednesday and Thursday. And then my test scores went up. It was great. It was like the most powerful use of Kahoot ever because Kahoot is a super high engagement. And the kids always wanted to play and wanted to win and everything. So they would just bite right into the experience. They didn't care that they were getting all the questions wrong. It didn't matter. Like it, they didn't seem bothered by it. And I'm not saying that's going to work for you directly, but I am saying that that means that like some of the tools that you use, even if you consider it to be maybe not the most powerful tool, could be a quite powerful tool in the right usage because we're not asking, we're not thinking about focusing on the tool. We're, we're thinking about focusing on how the tool is being used, what the tool is being used for, how you can position the tool strategically so that it's being used for powerful things. And a lot of times, a lot of times, that has more to do with how you're using the tool than what the tool is, okay? So <clears throat> I want to I think about this, okay? I want to think of this is another active learning thing, okay? We're going to ask you to do more. I told you, we're being ambitious here. We're being ambitious. I want you to think about two tools that you use in your classroom. I know you use more than two. We, more than two. we all use more than two. Just pick two, okay? Don't even care what they are, okay? They could probably tech tools, but if you want to use non-tech tools, I don't know, that's fine too. I don't even care, okay? Just two tools that you use in your classroom, okay? And those could even be strategies or routines. Like if you say, well, one of my tools is going to be small group time, okay? That's fine. That would be an interesting thing to explore. But here's what I want you to think about. One, what role is it serving? What's that tool being used to do? When you choose that tool from all the other tools you could choose, why do you reach for that one? Okay. And then how well is it doing that? If it's not doing it well, that's okay. Just know it. Just be honest about that. And if it's doing it great, then we all want to know. <laughs> Share it out. Okay. And then the third thing is, 
what's the cost benefit reality of that tool, right? Like this tool is going to be great in March, but in order to do that, I got to start with it in September because otherwise it just takes the kids a long time to get the hang of using it. And then we really need it by March. There's tools that are like that. And they're powerful enough that you're willing to invest that kind of time. There's other tools that are not that powerful and you wouldn't invest that kind of time. Okay. So you got to think a little bit about what's the cost benefit reality. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what am I going to do with all these thoughts? I'm thinking <laughs> I'm about to show you. All right. So over on the next slide, I want you to click right here or it's in the chat, put your thoughts here. And what this is, is a Google slide deck. And there's 50 ish slides on it. One of them is for you. Pick one. And then go in there and write your two tools. Write how the function, what, put the name of the tool, what function is it serving, how well does it serve in that function, and a, a sentence or so about the cost benefit. Okay, like what's it cost to get that tool and what's the investment you got to make and what's the benefit of it? Okay. So go ahead and pick one. The only thing to take it to, to keep in mind is don't scribble over somebody who's already on that slide. And this one I will not have to refresh because it's going to update live. And this is another one where if you think to yourself, ah, I'm not going to talk about that. Everybody knows that tool. Maybe, maybe we all know about it. And maybe you're using it in a super innovative way that we all want to hear about. There's value in an innovative use of a familiar tool because I'm more likely to see, I'm more likely to see the value of a tweak of a tool I'm already familiar with than an investment of having to learn a brand new tool. So don't be afraid that that tool you're thinking of is too routine or too simple. And if at the moment, <laughs> you feel like maybe we're asking you uh, to do an awful lot of thinking for a Monday in January at five o'clock. Believe me, I understand. If you could do one tool or if you want to scroll through and, and just read, I, I do understand that. Oh, plickers. Yeah. You don't see plickers out and about much, but boy, it's a good tool. I remember one time, sorry, I'm going to go into storytelling mode while you guys are finished up your typing. This is not a surprise to anybody who knows me. Um, but I saw this classroom that had many whiteboards, which that's not all that uncommon, but they had a plicker card on taped onto the back. So the kids could do their work. And then when it was time for them to vote with their plicker card, they'd hold the other side up and then allow them to use the plickers. They just kept them taped to the back. It was, I was the only time I've ever seen it. it was such a good idea. <clears throat> And if you want to keep this open in a tab and come back and finish up your thoughts, that would be okay. I don't want to cut anybody off, but I also know that we want to keep moving too. But make sure you give a scroll. There's all kinds of interesting things written of all different sorts. People talking about why they use warmups the way that they use them. Google Keep, which is another one of those tools that practically all of you have access to. And I it does not get used all that much. It's a great tool, though. Google Draw is another one. Smartboard, Flipgrid. Flipgrid is a good tool, too. I like how someone just put slide decks. Good call. The slide deck is such a good tool. Like, it, it, it gets overlooked. And, and death by PowerPoint was a phrase that really didn't do the, the slide deck any favors. But I taught off of slide decks because they're such great organizational tools. Okay. All right. So as you finish up, um, I, I bring a graphic up on the screen here. And <clears throat> um, this flow chart kind of talks a little bit about how um, the thought process for bringing a new tech tool into your classroom will work. And this is true of any kind of tool. We're gonna focus, a lot of the book is gonna focus on technology. 
And so like a lot of these tools in the back and things like that, these, there's a lot of tech going on. I, we, at, at the risk of over teching it a little bit, um, just know that this same thought process will work for non-tech tools that you're integrating in as well. But that first box says, what problem have you identified? Okay, bringing a tool in needs to be done for a reason. Every time you add a new thing to your classroom, you're going to disrupt things. It's just, it's going to happen. There's no way around it. So having a very clearly defined problem will help you very clearly define the purpose of trying something new. Um, how will you tell if the new tech tool is solving the problem? Okay. And what are the risks if it doesn't solve the problem? Okay. Remember that any problem you're observing, you could make worse. Just saying, I'm just going to say it out loud, just because you're trying to do something doesn't mean you're going to do it. So be cautious of what the risks are for integrating the tech tool too. Okay. And we said in IT, we see that all the time. Okay. People who just don't understand sort of like the back end data pieces or the how, how the licenses are going to set up if kids need to log in or whatever, things like that. Just pre think some of those things. And then uh, those are the, the risks. Now, the other side of things, how are you going to roll this tool out? Okay. Including how long will it take for the solution to be fully functional? The first time you roll a tool out, it's not going to solve the problem that you have in mind. Okay, it's going to take a little bit of practice. The kids are going to have to get better at it. You're going to have to get better at it. It's just going to, it's okay. Okay, so how are you going to pull that off though? Okay, are they, you know what I'm saying? What device are they going to need? Are they going to need to log in? Are they going to, how you can do all that stuff? And then what types of ongoing support will you and your students need to use the tool well? Okay, are you going to need some professional learning? Are the students going to need help? In an ongoing basis, every time they use the tool, they're going to need a pair of professional support or they're going to need to be in a small group or they're going to need a sheet of paper beside them. I mean, like, what are the various things that the ongoing use of the tool are going to bring in? All of these things are kind of related to the function first element. The goal is to solve the problem, okay, without adding new problems and without making the problem worse, right? So locking in on the pairing between the function of the tool and the problem you're trying to solve and keeping those things very closely connected before you put a new tool and during the use of that tool. Okay. And here are some things you want to be a little bit careful with. Okay. I'll bet my students would enjoy this. Okay. Be a little careful if you start thinking that thought, not because it's a bad thought. Obviously we do want to create environments that our students enjoy coming to that they feel comfortable in that they feel like they can be themselves and all of that, there's no doubt that that's true, okay? But an enjoyable classroom, a comfortable learning space, that's a means to an end. That's not an end in and of itself. The end is high levels of learning according to the goals that you have and the students have for themselves. That's the end, okay? So enjoyability is a good thing in as much as it's moving you toward the goals of your class and for you and your students. Oh, this is just like fill in the blank thing you already use, only better. So maybe you're a Kahoot user and then you're gonna replace Kahoot one-to-one -one with GimKit, okay? All right, implementations are clunky. You wanna be a little careful with this thought, okay? Be cautious upgrading because in the interim, it might be a downgrade. Until the students get the hang of using the new tool, you might, lose some functionality until they get the hang of it, okay? So think to yourself, if this is really a true upgrade and it's a valuable switch, and it might be, I'm not saying don't make the switch, I'm saying be cautious. If it's a true upgrade, then when's the right time to make that switch? And what's the right context to make that switch? Okay, all right. Last thing to be cautious with, we need to mix things up a little bit. <laughs> Said no kindergarten teacher ever, by the way. Um, <clears throat> When things are too predictable, kids tend to just come in at a lower gear. The great Russian Hurley said that, and he's not wrong. There's value in a little bit of unpredictability, not a ton, but enough to keep kids sharp and on their toes. Okay, that's true. But that's still a strategic decision. Okay, 
unpredictability is fickle in isolation. Just mixing it up for the heck of mixing it up is not as valuable as you might think. But being strategic about how you're mixing things up, there's a ton of value in keeping things fresh, keeping thing, keeping the kids on their toes a little bit, having it so that it's not so predictable all the time when they come into your classroom and things like that. Like I said, I bet my students would enjoy this. Oh, this is like the thing I already use, but better. And we need to mix things up a little bit. These are not bad thoughts. They're just thoughts you want to be a little bit careful with, especially when it comes to using them to integrate new tools. So closing quote, we want to be sure that you understand the why and not just the how of using an instructional tool. We hope that as you browse the strategies, you have many aha moments, discovering new reasons to use familiar tools and discovering new tools that help you implement strategies with which you may already be familiar. Okay, and there's a lot of that in the book, okay? This is a fam this some of this stuff is going to be familiar to you. The fact that you guys willingly chose to join us in this session means that you're focused on making things better for your students in an ongoing and continuous way. Okay, so we know you're doing powerful things in your classroom. That isn't in dispute. It's everybody wants to take the next step though and be a little more powerful, a little more inclusive, a little more barrier free, a little more supportive for that student that struggles. Okay. Okay. I yes, can't I think I think we have a the video. I just want to preface it as you know we're trying. This is a message that we're trying to set as changing people's mindsets on things. So um, I found this video. It's from um, uh, institution in in England, and um, it's a research and training institute. And I'm going to put the website in the chat for you, but. Um, just go ahead. We just it's just a two minute, two and a half minute video and, and uh, um, enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to have a chat to you about dyslexia. Anyone be interested in having a dyslexic baby? What the hell kind of a question is that? World's first dyslexic sperm bank. Open today. Hello, good morning. What's brought you in today? Just a bit intrigued, actually. <laughs> Tell me, what do you know about dyslexia? I don't know, is that like jumbled up with writing? In that disability. You're kind of siphoned off and put in the, the special room. A lot of people think that people with dyslexia are stupid. I've heard that word used a lot. Given the choice, yeah. would you like your child to have dyslexia? No. I wouldn't kill it. I have a restaurant. Right. My head chef is dyslexic. Okay. And there's certain things I just wouldn't give him to do at all. Only 3% of people see dyslexia as anything other than a disadvantage. But look at the people around this room. Steve Jobs, co-founder of Apple, inventor of the iPhone. Who's more of an icon for genius than Albert Einstein? We've got a whole catalogue here full of people who uh, are or were dyslexic, like Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, Alexander Graham Bell, who invented the telephone. Dyslexics have a difference in their brains that makes them literally see the world a bit differently. Quite a lot of good looking ones. Love. Slightly jealous. <laughs> Did you know that 40% of self made millionaires are dyslexic? Say that again. What? That's amazing. It hasn't held any of them back. The value of these individuals and their contribution to all areas is just really yeah. encouraging. And all of these dynamic achievers need to be given up as positive examples. It does not need to be a barrier to achievement. If you were thinking about how most people see dyslexia, what, what words do you think people would use to describe them? Uh, at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. But by the sounds of it, they're not. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I spent, before I had this job, I spent 
13, 14 years as a special ed teacher. And, and when I saw this video, it just reminded me of, of my first couple of years teaching. I was teaching at Lansing Eastern and having conversation with my classroom of kids. Um, and they, um, they were, they said, you know, we were talking about children somehow. And, um, and it came up, the kids were saying, they were like, no, I don't want to have children. I don't want to have a kid like me, you know, kind of thing. You think, oh, what a sad story when they could have, you know, now as adults, I'm sure that they've had um, some success in their lives and, and, and being able to show different um, positive things that has gone on. So, um, but the video was just a way, another way of looking at things and changing your mindset on on life and on what kids you have in your classroom. You know, they may think differently than us. We take a look at um, the first um, activity that we had you guys do and take um, figure out how did you um, get groceries into your home? You know, and if you go back and look and see, you know, there's what, 35 different people here. And, and we had many different ways of the, um, getting groceries into your house. Well, think about your classroom. You have many kids in there. You have many different learners. And, and um, so it was just kind of changing the mindset of, of what's going on. So um, when I'm here, my section is on authentic inclusion and it's one of the section introduction sections in the book and you know I I when researching this and going over this and talking to um, our other colleagues that are, are presenting today I, I keep flipping authentic inclusion with authentic instruction so you know I I'm like oh my gosh you know as a special ed teacher you know I wanted to have my kids be able to have uh, authentic education, a classroom that's authentic for them, that they can feel like they have learned something and feel good about themselves on it. So, you know, it, it, so in my mind, I see this as how do we make our instruction authentic for everyone, everybody in the classroom? And, um, I put my first quote down here is, is true inclusion happens when we design educational experiences with everyone in mind. So, and I think there's, um, you, I think we're all here trying to figure that out. How do we make this beneficial for everybody in our classroom? But if you look at the first couple of words in the sentences is, you know, how do we design the educational experience? So we're looking at designing something ahead of time, a foundation for these um, for your classroom to be able to do these things. And then earlier on in our session, Christy had a quote on um, you know true inclusion is true inclusion experiences designed in such a way that any learner, regardless of ability, can participate in it and learn from it. So that's our goal. You know, we have all these kids, all different types of learners. We have kids that are on the brilliant scale, and then we have kids that are struggling. Um, we have to meet the needs as best we can with, um, with all those kids um, for us. So one of the things that happens as a special ed teacher is you spend a lot of time coming up with a plan for every kid on your caseload. Um, and part of that plan, a significant portion of that plan is how much time does that student work in general ed or have general ed experiences? And so, um, and we, we calculate that in minutes. So, but we wanna take this more than just the minutes that are in general ed. We don't want to take them to a classroom and put them in a general ed classroom and have a table for those kids that can't keep up with, with what's happening in the classroom. 
we need to be able to come up with a way to um, be flexible enough that we have things in our foundation that um, we're teaching everybody in the class. So we have, we have our teaching goals that we have coming down from the state, but how does this relate to kids that may not be able to um, have the same reading level or may not have the same co um, cognitive abilities? How can we get match those goals, those teacher goals, with the same um, those special ed goals that we um, we would have? So being able to do that, a guiding principle to this is flexibility and providing options to promote learner um, agency and intrinsically motivates individuals to actively engage in their learning. So if we're able to have some flexible in the classroom um, that helps kids think, hey, I'm doing something, I'm, this is positive for me, I understand this, um, I'm feeling success, then they can, um, it's a success for all of us. It may not be the same thing other kids are learning um, in the class or, or to the degree of, of, of learning, but they're getting something out of your classroom. Um, Andrew, so, so when, when, um, when the special ed teacher is taking a, a student and place them in a general ed class, there's a conversation that needs to happen. And it may be a paper conversation, but it, if it, um, a person, the person conversation that you need to ask these things of, um, what can this student do? What does the student struggle in? And then what things can we can support the student in this class that make them successful? So, and those are all the, uh, everything that's involved in of scaffolding. If we can scaffold something, we can support a kid somehow with another person, with technology, we are, everyone here is, that we're presenting, the four of us are, are technology people and, and we see the benefit of using technology to be, help scaffold that those, um, those lessons or that unit that you may have for um, kids. But it ends up that the special ed and general ed have to have these critical conversations to make this uh, an authentic inclusion for um, every kid that we have in the classroom. So um, some of the things, some of the examples that may have um, for flexibility um, is when you're showing a video, you may need to have a close, you have to have closed caption um, available. So when you pick a video, make sure, and you may not even know the kids that you have in the classroom yet, it's back to making a foundation or designing your classroom pick the video that has closed caption. You may not have a kid that needs that closed captioning for two or three more years, but you, you have an anchor video that is shown in your classroom, um, in your language arts class, and you know it has closed captioning. So when you have somebody that needs it, you don't have to call me and search around and look for a couple of weeks and trying to find closed captioning DVDs. Um, Books is another example of, of flexibility. So like Christy had explained um, when she introduced a book in our session today, that um, there was 11% uh, of, of the group that um, has signed up wanted eBooks. They wanted an alternative text. Huh. Think of that. Think of your books that you have in your classroom. Do you have 11% um, of your A Raisin in the Sun um, book on uh, some type of alternative text. Just have it around. You may not need it this year, but you're probably gonna need it for three or four kids next year. And you may find out that kids that you have, um, they're not even on caseload, enjoy the, um, having eBooks on there. I don't know of any kid that doesn't like to have some book read to them including high school kids. 
So, you know, and Andrew. So, you know, these are just some examples that um, that come up with, with the flexibility piece where, you know, the physical arrangement in your classroom, you know, you could, that helps with being able to do more things flexible within teams. Maybe there's an area where a calming area, all those kinds of things can benefit for us and designing a classroom that um, has flexibility. I know that's a tough one right now and it's been tough for the last couple of years, but you know, keep that in mind, you know, keep that in your toolbox that, wow, you know, I could have these two chairs put together to meet this little, I have this group here, or I can have this area right here for my calming area so we can have a relaxed atmosphere for everybody in the classroom. You know, um, so flexible timelines. What is our goal in our teaching classes? Is our goal to, to make people responsible to getting things on time? You know, um, maybe we need to be a little bit more flexible on, on some of these things, um, timelines that we have for um, our, our units that we're, we're showing. Because maybe we'll get more fulfilling, deeper knowledge things if we flex those timelines a little bit and not be so rigid on, on, on those kind of things. So think about some of the things that you are doing right now that you would consider, hmm, you know, I'm, I'm pretty flexible in this area. Or, and then think about, hmm, I could, maybe this summer I can work on this unit to make some things embedded into that unit that will make things a lot um, more flexible for me. So I can um, have uh, more of an authentic inclusion classroom for any kid that may end up um, getting plopped into my classroom. Okay, so I want to know more about yourselves. So, and I think that for us to be able to do that, we need to be able to have um, everyone kind of understand who is here. Christy showed us a pie graph of, of um, a, a general pie graph of where people are from and, and um, what classes they're teaching, but um, this is a Padlet and a Padlet, um, can we can use this as um, for slides. No, Andrew, you wanna pop what, this open for us and they can, um, explain it a little bit better that way too. So what we're looking for for you guys is um, to answer some questions for us. So um, there's three questions here and um, we'd like for you to comment. You can do as you can go, there's a little picture. Yep, Andrew has a click where you can comment right down below and then add your text to you know, the, the first question is, what is your role in education? Well, I'm a special ed teacher at a local high school um, thing. So if you feel like you're going to write an awful lot, go ahead and click that pink plus button on the bottom right corner, and then you can end up um, writing as much as you want. Just place it, click and drag it underneath um, one of the, the columns or the pictures that I have. So the, the second question then is what I would like to know is, is what is your strengths that you bring to the table? What's your superpower? You know, that's important when you're advocating for kids and then talking to other adults and trying to make a good fit for a classroom for a kid. So then, then the third one is, what is something you'd like to, de um, to delegate? <laughs> so for me, I would like to delegate all my written material so I don't misspell anything. So, um, you know, so go ahead. Um, we'll, we'll put the Padlet link in there for you in the chat. Um, and, and if you're following along on the slide deck on another screen or on another tab, you can just click it on the on the um, on your slide deck. I love these questions, Phil, and I think when we are thinking about authentic inclusion in our classrooms and our learning environments, these are 
kinds of the things we want to know about our students. I think the people here, I know several of you, and you're all so great at making those strong relationships with your students. And that's kind of what drives your ability to, to create this authentic, authentically inclusive environment for uh, your students. So this is great. I love reading these answers. Yeah, I like this. I, I'm great at being um, with relationships and building relationships with students. That's so huge. I mean, that solves a lot of problems when you're able to uh, relate to people and, and be, being able to get along. Somebody says, I'm good at reflecting. I like that. That's a good, that's a good superpower to have. Not everybody reflects. Well, I'm one of those people. I tend to just move on to the next thing. <laughs> but people who have, who are very comfortable calming themselves down and looking backwards for a moment for the sake of moving forward better. That's a very good superpower. Empathy and listening. That's a good one too. I'm good at seeing multiple viewpoints and getting others to compromise. That's, that's cool. Well, thank you guys for doing all this. And um, I'll be sure to put this in our Google group so everybody can see this. So we're gonna wrap up here with this last section. And um, this one is, an, again, an idea that we pulled from the introduction of the Inclusive Learning 365 book. And it's the idea of design over accommodations. So as educators, we all are um, given um, IEP at a glance paperwork, um, or we're given 504 plans, or we just get to know our students to know that, okay, this accommodation works really well for this student. This one works well for that student. So we're making all these kinds of tweaks um, to our um, delivery or our grading or our expectations for this lesson. Um, and this section of the book just talks about the design piece. What if we could design that experience so inclusively that there's minimal to even no need for those accommodations. Um, and if we design it in a way, in that way, every learner would have some achievable option available to them. Now we know that with the wide range of um, disabilities that our students do come with us, um, come to us with, there is still a need for some accommodations. If we have a student who's deaf, we're still going to need to provide them with a sign language interpreter. Um, so obviously our design cannot eliminate the need for all accommodations. Um, but the amazing thing, I think that we have all realized with the pandemic and needing to kind of design our instruction in a different way is that I think we've all been able to design it in a way that is a little bit more inclusive to all learners. Um, through the use of increased technology, um, all of the built-in tools that our, our students' Chromebooks have or MacBooks or whatever they're given, um, through that, we've been able to design things that are pretty inclusive. So this is a great time to talk about this and to build upon that as well. Um, so what are accommodations? Um, accommodations in general and how the book describes them is when changes are made to the educational experience to fit the needs of those who couldn't otherwise participate in the same way as their peers. Um, but when we think about accommodations in this way, it implies that there's really just one main or correct way of doing things. So there's the main way, there's the correct way, and then there's the way that might need to be accommodated or there are the students who might need it done in a different way. So think back to our grocery example. Um, we realized through that, through that Jamboard that there wasn't really one main way or one correct way of getting food into our house. We all did it in a way that works best for us. Um, we've probably tweaked it along the way. I actually was reading through those and I was like, oh, wait a minute, that's a good idea. I'm gonna try that next time I am needing to get groceries. Um, so there isn't just one main way or correct way of doing things. Um, and that's the case for our educational experiences as well. Um, 
So we're gonna just do a really quick waterfall activity. Um, and you guys have maybe done these back in the days of uh, virtual learning where you might have asked your learners a question, ask them to type it in the chat, but don't press enter until you said go. I've heard that term um, or called a waterfall. So we're gonna do that for our activity here. Um, and we're going to think about some kind of typical things that happen in an educational environment. And we're gonna think about, um, was this part of the initial design or was this an accommodation that occurred? Um, so that's all you're gonna type in the chat. You're going to type initial design or you're going to type accommodation. And you're going to use that term to match these different scenarios on the following slides. But again, don't press enter until I say go. So let's look at the first scenario on the next slide. All right, so here's something we might need to do. We need, might need to set up our learning environment for navigation by a person who uses a wheelchair. So you're going to type initial design if this was part of um, the initial design for your environment, or you're going to type accommodation. So maybe just a minute to type that word or words and press enter, go. Awesome. This is kind of what I hoped for. I wanted to kind of to see a mix of, of answers here. And really it's the way that we think about it or it's the mindset that we're bringing to this. Um, if we know we have a learner who uses a wheelchair, of course, we're going to make sure that our classroom is designed to accommodate them. Um, but what if, for example, next week my niece is getting knee surgery, she's going to be in a wheelchair at school for a couple of weeks, and maybe now all of her classes have to kind of redesign their classrooms. So maybe setting it up initially so that no matter who comes to your room, whether there's surgeries, whether there's somebody who uses a wheelchair, um, whether you um, have a paraprofessional who needs to bring a cart to your room every day for medical equipment or something, maybe the initial design could just be the case that um, it's it, your room is easy to navigate around. Now I know many of you have 30 plus students in your room and that's and you're confined and restricted by the square footage of your space, but it's just something to think about. All right, the next one, providing an adult to scribe notes or answers to open response test questions. So again, you're going to type in the chat, initial design or accommodation. I'll give you just a minute to type that. And we will press enter in three, two, one. Yeah, so this would be something kind of to retrofit that activity. If we have a lesson that requires note taking or we have a test that requires open-ended responses and we have a student who um, has a written output barrier for whatever reason, one option to accommodate that student might be to provide um, them with an adult to support them to scribe notes. Um, so that's something we'll think about in future sessions is how we might redesign that activity um, initially so that that accommodation maybe doesn't need to occur. So we'll be talking more about that as we move on to other sessions. The next one, enabling closed captioning on all videos shown in your learning environment. Is that part of your initial design for that activity? Or is that an accommodation that you might make in your learning environment? So type in those words and three, two, one. Oh man, look at you guys. Yeah, that's just part of your initial design. Um, there's so much research out there that supports the use of closed captioning on videos where we used to only provide that for students who have a hearing impairment. Um, now there's so much research saying 
we all need it. For those of us who just need another mode of input, I know I need it. I always have closed captioning on in my house and people think it's crazy. And then I have to turn it off when there's sports games because it covers up the, the score. But anyway, I've got it because if I'm cooking in the kitchen and I didn't hear and I want to look up real quick to see what I missed, I can read it. Or if there's background noise, it's there just as an option. So um, just enabling that as part of an initial design for your environment. Andrew keeps his on too. Yeah, then you don't have to have a volume. I really started it when I was watching, I think maybe it was Game of Thrones where there's, you know, real thick accents and I just, a lot of different character names that were hard for me to understand. So it worked out well and now I've, I've kept it on. All right, making your class notes and outline available electronically. Real quick, initial design or accommodation? Three, two, one. Yeah. Yep. Um, so it depends. Um, there might be students who require this as an accommodation because they need the technology components to be able to type on those worksheets, to be able to have your outline or your class notes read aloud for te through text to speech. Um, but also it could be part of your initial design for all students, maybe um, for organization purposes, students might be able to save your outline online and not lose it rather than that piece of paper you gave them that's going to be gone by week two. You know, um, I found that people are using their um, Google Classroom for those kind of things that when they had them on their online learning, they just, they've already had that all set up for people and they can just give them a link to what they need. Right. Yeah, and it's just there to reference back when they need to. Andrew said, what about students who are absent, especially this year? Um, yeah, keeping your daily agenda slides in Google Classroom, or people are using Google Sites, Schoology. Um, there's all sorts of ways to help your students stay organized. Um, yeah, Andrew, you're getting ahead there. We're going we're gonna to have some fun tools <laughs> to try out other modes. Yes, thank you guys. I, was that the last one or is there one more scenario? I'm kind of following along as you, oh, here we go. Um, we talked about this, Phil talked about this. How about giving every learner a hard copy of the novel being read in your class? Is this part of an initial design or an accommodation? I'm ready, go. Yeah. So. We talked about this too with the book that we're giving you guys. We went back and forth on what should we do? Should everybody get the hard copy? Everybody likes a hard copy. Even if you're gonna use uh, the, the Kindle version like I'm using, maybe I still might want the hard copy to reference because if somebody says, look at page 200, I don't have page 200 on my Kindle app. It's, I don't have page numbers. That's something else we ran into when we were going through this training is, realizing that the setup of the eBooks is so different from the hard copy. Um, so like Phil said, having um, a variety of book options in your classroom would probably be that initial design um, to, to strive for, to have hard copies available, have eBooks, audiobooks, digital text available so that your learners can um, access what they know is best for them. And I think it would be accurate to say too that like retrofitting all of that can be tricky. So if you have a novel that you really, really like and you only have hard copies now, going back and kind of getting ebooks and getting audiobooks could be tricky. But knowing that that's what you need, then moving forward, if you think to yourself, okay, there's these two or three books that might meet my needs well, uh, let's see which one of them is available in multiple modes. And that will be, that will help me make my decision as far as which books I choose to bring into my classroom. It's a lot easier to go forward thinking these things than it is to try and like fix things up. And that's why we say design over accommodation. You know, that to add to what Andrew's saying too, it's, it's so much easier to do what Andrew's describing than for Christy or I to come to your classroom and try to figure out if your student is eligible for Bookshare books or 
eligible for a, a free copyright copy of of a book that's an alternative text. It's it take it's a long laborious process, and if we already have that taken care of, anybody can have that book, not just a particular kid with a particular disability. Okay, Kim, you're gonna have to show me how to <laughs> show the page numbers. Mine change every time I change the layout of my book. Um, so I don't know, I couldn't get it to match the hard copy book. Um, this is just a quick reflection piece and maybe something to come back to between now and our second session in March. But to kind of think of that typical experience in your classroom where every student in your room is engaging it, um, engaging with that experience in the same way. Um, and then think about that accommodation that you have to make or accommodations for the multiple students in your classroom. Um, and then the question would just be, is there a way that I could design this so that those accommodations were um, maybe not needed or of lesser extreme, maybe I'm not needing to retrofit this experience to meet the needs of those kids because the way I designed it already allows them with that flexibility and options to access it in a different way. Um, so just something to ponder in our, our quote here, Andrew, on the next slide. If you design educational experiences for everyone, then you don't need to provide accommodations to anyone. And um, when I read that, I think, oh boy, now I'm, a, now I'm designing 30 different experiences because I have 30 students in my classroom. And that's not really the idea of this quote. It's that we're designing it in a way that our students have, uh, are increasing their learner agency and being able to make choices for how they interact with that experience that you're designing. And like, that's really ambitious. Like that, that quote is really ambitious, but like, it's like, it's like Allison was saying at the beginning, like if you just kind of focus on staying attuned to learning new things and have a routine for exploring, then every now and again, you'll be able to pull a tool in that'll add a little bit more flexibility. You'll pull another tool in or a strategy or a technique or use something in a slightly different way. And little by little, you'll see that you'll be able to design more increasingly flexible experiences. And before you know it, you've got all kinds of in thoughts that become more routine. And then the students find that they are able to own their learning a little bit. And you'd be surprised how many students choose things that ordinarily might be considered accommodated or some sort of altered form, but they yeah. don't, they just choose it because they prefer that way and they learn great doing it. Yeah. So there's a jam board here. I think for the sake of time, we might just open it and talk about it rather than using it as an interactive activity. Um, when you get your book, uh, hopefully sometime within the next 30 days or so, you will see that the authors have chosen um, specific words and they use words uh, these are, this is just a handful of examples, but the words across the top here are words that they've chosen deliberately. So they use the word learner instead of using the word student. They use the word educator instead of using the word teacher. I'm sorry, I have a device ringing over there on the other side of the room. Just, yeah, dance like Andrew. Experiences was one that, um, kind of struck me as interesting that they use the word experiences rather than lesson or assignment. And when you just think about that, when you hear the word experience, it already has kind of a more positive or enticing or engaging approach rather than an assignment. Um, the word invite they use rather than the word assign or um, so we're not going to do anything with this, but as you get your book, just kind of take note of that. Um, and think about maybe why the authors chose to use those words in this book. I, I used to, my students, we didn't use experience or assignment. We'd say DO versus DUE. And they'd say, what, is this a DO or is this DUE? And I'd say, this is a thing we're going to DO do, but it's not DUE do. We're just going to DO do it. 
and you'd hear him. It's a shower. Is it D-O or is it D-U-E? <laughs> do or do. Is do or do. That's a good I one. Said, I want you to do it. But it's not do. <laughs> so just to wrap up today, and you guys have been so great. I know it's getting dark outside. And um, oh, Beth, yes, I can see that. She always invites her students. So we're inviting you to, to join us or to do this activity. <laughs> Um, inclusive education, by definition, it removes barriers, promotes accessibility, fosters learner agency by embracing the fact that everyone is unique, and by designing awesome educational experiences built with flexibility, empowerment, and joyfulness in mind. I'm going to turn off my mic now since I've got a dog barking and a doorbell ringing. All right. To wrap up. Um, I'm going to address a few things with the Google group and then just a few reminders. So we invite you to join the Google group if you have not already done so. I see what I did there. Um, so just to give you a little context, the purpose of this Google group is to serve as a place for participants and us facilitators to communicate. So we'll share, you know, like the recording links, reminders, key information, um, you know, probably some of the activities we've done circle back to, um, but the goal is also to serve as a collaborative space for you to pose questions and share your experiences and successes, challenges, all that good stuff throughout the next few months. So it's not just a one-way communication. Um, the idea is like, we encourage you to use this, um, for your own, you know, collaborative needs as well. Um, so if you haven't already done so, using the link that Andrew provided in Friday's email, um, or you can click on the link in the title in the slide deck, um, or if someone wants to throw it in the chat, um, you will just need to click ask to join group um, once you click on that link, and then it will um, pop up to your Google account, it'll automatically link. Um, and then you'll want to keep the default to subscription notifications to every new message so you don't miss anything. And then click ask to join. And just a couple of things to consider. If you do not receive emails from this group, um, like you've signed up, you, you know, you're good to go and you're like, I'm not seeing anything. Um, check your spam folder and then adjust the settings accordingly. Uh, we test this out a lot. And for some reason, some of us had no issues and others, um, it went to our spam. We tested it with both personal accounts and our work accounts. Um, so that's just a recommendation to keep an eye for. And then if Google Groups is blocked for your district, um, as I mentioned, we recommend you just use a personal Gmail account as a workaround to gain access. Um, and then for all of this process, if you're still um, having trouble or you just haven't gotten to requesting access yet, um, there is a help doc that guides you directly through this process with screenshots linked in this slide deck. Um, and it, you know, just walks you through everything. So we will stick around for a couple minutes after the close of this session. Um, if anybody has any individual needs or questions in regard to the Google group, if anyone's having any you know, issues. Um, but hopefully that gives you some context. You can expect to see some posts, you know, coming out um, every, I'd say probably every week, every other week. Um, but also don't necessarily wait for us to post stuff. Feel free to, you know, post questions or if you've got um, a new nugget of knowledge you want to share with the group, we encourage you to do that as well. Um, and then just moving on to the next slide for next steps for the rest of, um, or for preparing for session two, we will be delivering slash shipping your books and your um, ed tech boxes. Um, the, the goal is, the plan is prior to session two. And once you receive your book or your ebook, we encourage you to preview that book when it arrives. So maybe consider especially reading the introduction, um, just to help guide you how to approach the book. In fact, in big letters, they have like a, a section of the intro that's like, stop, read this intro first, um, because it's that important to approach the book differently based on their guidance. Um, and a lot of it's going to be reiterated to what, you know, we talked about today, but if, um, just to give you some context, it might not hurt to do that. 
Um, another reminder, make sure you uh, completed this sign-in sheet on the sign-in form that was um, linked in the slide deck and in the chat um, if you didn't already do so during the break. Uh, we want you to submit um, your information regardless if you want sketches or not. It is for attendance purposes. And, um, you know, just again, make sure you're joining the um, Educator Workshop Google group and maybe even bookmark the group for easy reference to the group. Um, and we'll be posting information there between now and Pi Day, which is um, moves us to our next slide, which is just reiterating our next session, session two, March 13th, session three, May 2nd. Um, no, 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 no. March 13th is a Sunday. That's March 14th is our next session. That's a Monday. I was told about that in the chat. It's supposed to be a Monday. I will go ahead and change that. <laughs> I am not leading a session on a Sunday, y'all. Yeah, it's going to be a hard pass by me as well. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, so anyway, thanks for attending session one of the Educators Workshop Learning Series. And we look forward to seeing you on, Andrew, what day is it? Hi day. Hi. Monday, March 14th. March 14th for session two. And again, feel free to stick around if you have any questions or need support for the Google group.